News of the Times Murderous Mondays The Strange Case of the East Cliff Mallet Murder Welcome to News of the Times. In today's episode, we are in the seaside town of Bournemouth in March 1935. 67-year-old retired architect Francis Rattenbury is found gravely bludgeoned on his head in his home. He dies a few days later. The suspects, his beautiful 31-year-old wife Alma and the man with whom she is carrying on an illicit affair, the 18-year-old hired gardener stroke chauffeur George Stoner. But wait, more unexpected tragedy ensues in this 1935 complicated and interesting case from the seaside resort of Bournemouth. And is it actually clear who did it? Step back in time to 1935 and the East Cliff Mallet murder in the resort of Bournemouth. We hope you enjoy the show. Bournemouth in 1935 was a popular seaside resort town attracting a wide array of visitors, especially in the summer. What would become the East Cliff Mallet murder case all began with a small advert posted in September 1934 in the papers. Daily willing lad, 14 to 18, for housework, scout trained preferred, apply between 11 and 12 and 8 and 9 at 5 Manor Road, Bournemouth. The imposing house Villa Madeira on 5 Manor Road in Bournemouth's prestigious East Cliff was the home of the famous international architect Francis Rattenbury. Francis was born in Yorkshire. When he was 24, Francis had travelled to Canada looking to make his mark as an architect. Here, he designed the Parliament buildings for Victoria and British Columbia. He also designed the luxurious Empress Hotel on Victoria's waterfront, as well as the Lord Courts in Vancouver. Known as a ruthless businessman, Francis had few friends when some of his business ventures left him short of funds. It was while he was working in Vancouver that Francis, then 57 years old, met his wife-to-be, the 29-year-old Alma Pakenham. Alma Pakenham, an extraordinary beauty. Alma had what would be considered something of a checkered past when she met Francis. Alma was a native of British Columbia and an accomplished musician. At 19, Alma had married Ulsterman Caledon Doling. The couple moved to England where Doling enlisted in the army to fight in the First World War and Doling died on the battlegrounds. In response, Alma joined the Scottish Ambulance Unit working behind the French lines. Her bravery was commended and she was awarded the Croix de Guerre. At the end of World War I, Alma married Captain Compton Pakenham. The couple moved to America and had one son, Christopher. The marriage broke up and Alma moved back to her home of British Columbia, where she supported herself as a musician. It was while having a drink at the Empress Hotel that she met the architect of the hotel, Francis Rattenbury. Francis was immediately smitten with the very beautiful Alma. When she met Francis, Alma was still married to her second husband. The affair she carried on with Francis whilst married to her second husband became a scandal in insular Victoria with a corresponding impact on Francis's reputation within conservative Victoria. Alma managed to obtain a divorce from her second husband, whilst Rattenbury's acrimonious divorce from his own wife labelled Alma as co-respondent in the divorce proceedings. 
Alma and Francis went on to marry. No longer accepted in polite society within British Columbia, the couple moved to the resort town of Bournemouth in England. Alma brought with her her young son from her second marriage, Christopher. Alma and Francis would go on to have one more son together, John. The couple moved to England and settled in the beach resort of Bournemouth on the well-to-do side of town, Eastcliff. They advertised for a general all-round young lad to help with the grounds upkeep, act as a chauffeur and do all-round odd jobs. Eighteen-year-old George Stoner was hired. Two months after starting his job at Villa Madeira, he was invited to live in the house. By this time, Alma and Francis had been married for ten years. Eighteen-year-old George was known as a shy young man with no history of girlfriends. A local lad, his family came from Redhill in Bournemouth, and his grandparents lived in Ensbury Park, Bournemouth. Francis was known to be a heavy drinker, with a propensity to depression. Francis slept alone downstairs, away from his wife. He was known to imbibe large quantities of whiskey. Alternatively, Alma, at 31, was considered a beautiful woman. Reports claimed that Francis was aware of the intimacy between 31-year-old Alma and 18-year-old George Stoner, the hired help, and that Francis didn't mind. The same did not hold for George Stoner, who over time became known to be extremely possessive of Alma and to fly into a rage on the rare occasions where Francis and Alma would spend time together. The build-up. The weekend of March the 23rd, 1935, Alma and George had spent a romantic getaway weekend in London. Upon their return, it was evident that Francis was even more depressed than usual. Attempting to cheer her husband up, Alma set up a trip for them both to visit friends in Bridgeport, just Francis and Alma as a couple. George, upon hearing of the following weekend's plans, became enraged. He went to his grandparents' house, not far away, where he collected a mallet. He explained that he needed the mallet to put up a screen in the garden of Villa Madeira. On Sunday evening, Francis was found gravely injured with dreadful head wounds. He looked to have been bludgeoned. Francis was rushed to hospital. Doctors quickly realised how severe Francis's injuries were and that the injuries were potentially fatal. Police were contacted. In the early hours of Monday morning, police arrived at Villa Madeira to find a very drunk Alma confessing that she had done him, a supposed reference to Francis, her husband of ten years. From the Dundee Evening Telegraph, the 25th of March, 1935, wife charged, alleged wounding of husband. Victoria Rattenbury, 31, described as of Manor Road, Bournemouth, was at Bournemouth today remanded in custody until April the 2nd on a charge of wounding or causing grievous bodily harm to her husband, Mawson Francis Rattenbury, on Sunday night, with intent to murder him. Mrs Rattenbury, wearing a fur coat, sat down immediately on entering the dock, apparently slightly dazed. Inspector Carter said that at 4.20am today he went to the address of Manor Road and made an examination. After further inquiries he charged Mrs Rattenbury with attempting to murder and kill her husband. She made no statement and later when she was charged at the police station she replied, That's quite right. I did it deliberately and would do it again.
Her husband is now in a Bournemouth nursing home with head injuries. He has been operated upon. Alma was arrested and held on remand. A few days later, Francis died from his injuries and the charge became that of murder. Meanwhile, George, still living in Villa Madeira, confesses to the maid that he had attacked Francis Rattenbury with a mallet. George was then arrested. From the Evening Chronicle, the 29th of March, 1935. Architect's death. His wife and chauffeur in custody. Man accused of murder. Dramatic arrest at the station. Villa tragedy. There was a sensational development today in connection with the death of Francis Mawson Rattenbury, who was found on Sunday night lying unconscious at his house, the Villa Madeira, a manor road in Bournemouth, with severe head injuries. He died yesterday in a nursing home. His wife, Alma Victoria Rattenbury, 31, was subsequently charged with wounding with attempt to murder him and was remanded in custody until Tuesday. At Bournemouth Police Court, Percy Stoner, 19, whose address was also given as the Villa Madeira, was charged that on March the 21st he murdered Francis Mawson Rattenbury. Stoner stepped briskly into the dock and smiled at the back of the court at some people one of them his mother. Arrested at the station. Inspector Carter said last evening he saw Stoner alight from a London train at Bournemouth station. He took him to the police station where he was cautioned and charged with the murder of Mr. Rattenbury hitting by him on the head with a wooden mallet. In reply to the charge, Stoner said, I understand. Superintendent Deacon said that he asked on that evidence for a remand until Tuesday next. In the meantime, he would communicate with the Director of Public Prosecutions and there would probably be, be a further remand. The magistrates agreed and a little later Stoner was brought back into court and applied for a certificate for legal aid, which was granted. Interest in the case was high. George was a local lad and of the poorer social class. Alma, with her luxury villa in the high end of Bournemouth, brought in the socialite interest. The inquest, something of a foregone conclusion, took place within a fortnight of the murder. From the Manchester Evening News, the 2nd of April 1935. Wife and chauffeur accused of murder. Young widow on trial for murder. Chauffeur also charged with crime. Mrs. Alma Victoria Rattenbury, 31, and George Percy Stoner, 19, both of the Villa Madeira in Manor Road in Bournemouth, were charged at Bournemouth today with the murder of Francis Mawson Rattenbury, husband, a retired architect. On the application of the superintendent, they were remanded until Thursday, the superintendent stating that the public prosecutions would be then prepared to go on with the case. The original charge. Mrs. Rattenbury was originally charged with wounding her husband with intent to murder him and last Monday was remanded until today. Mr. Rattenbury died on Thursday from head injuries in a Bournemouth nursing home. On the following day, Stoner was charged with murdering him and was also remanded until today. Only a small part of a crowd of about 150 people who had waited for an early hour gained admittance to the small court. Mrs. Rattenbury appeared completely composed. She was dressed in a fur coat, brown hat and woollen gloves and during the brief proceedings leant over the front of the dock with one hand against her face. Stoner, in a smartly cut, grey striped suit, stood up with his hands by his side. 
The case was a sensation across England due to the crowds and concerns regarding getting a fair trial within the Greater Bournemouth area. The trial was moved to the Old Bailey in London. From the Lincolnshire Echo, the 25th of May, 1935. Trial of wife and chauffeur, Old Bailey drama on Monday. What promises to be one of the most dramatic trials in the recent history of the Old Bailey will open before Mr Justice Humphreys on Monday. It is that of Mrs Alma Victoria Rattenbury, 31, a songwriter under the name of Lausanne, and George Percy Stoner, 19, her former chauffeur. They are accused of the murder of Mrs Rattenbury's 67-year-old husband, Mr Francis Mawson Rattenbury, a retired architect, who had occupied a leading position in his profession in Canada, where Mrs Rattenbury was born. The case was committed from Bournemouth, where Mr and Mrs Rattenbury lived at the Villa Madeira Manor Road. Mr Rattenbury was found there with head injuries on the night of March the 24th and died four days later in a nursing home. The rush for seats. Great interest has already been displayed in the trial and a large number of applications, many from well-known people, have been received from the privileged seats behind the council. The trial is expected to last a week. The trial was dramatic. Both parties had separate counsel. Alma had two highly priced exclusive counsels, and the trial started off badly. On the first day, reference is made of a letter sent by Alma to George in which she indicates that she will be throwing the full responsibility of the crime onto the shoulders of young George. From the Evening Dispatch, the 27th of May, 1935, common design to get rid of a man in the way, alleged statements by wife and chauffeur, situation was likely to become difficult. Mr Caswell referred the judge to a part of a letter written by Mrs Rattenbury from Holloway Prison to Stoner. In this letter, it showed a distinct intention to throw the responsibility on the prisoner, George Stoner. The Trial Both Alma and George pleaded not guilty at the trial, which took place at the Old Bailey on May the 27th, 1935. The trial had to be moved to London due to its high interest in the greater Bournemouth area. George remained silent throughout the trial. Alma, with the financial access available to her, had a very strong defence team. The papers and the public disliked Alma, who was seen as having led young George Stoner astray. She was regularly booed as she entered the Old Bailey courthouse. With separate defence counsel for both parties, the trial became acrimonious between the two. George Stoner's defence did much to highlight the vast difference in age and social class between Mrs Rattenbury and George. From the Evening Dispatch, the 27th of May, 1935, little more than a boy. Opening the case, Mr Croom Johnson said the prisoners who pleaded not guilty were charged with the murder of Mr. Rattenbury. The sad feature of this case is that Stoner is a young man, living more than a boy rather than an 18 years of age gentleman. He was employed in the house living in, as you will hear described as a chauffeur and a handyman. Mrs. Rattenbury had a banking account of her own. It was fed from time to time by payments into it, usually in around sums of forty or fifty pounds from Mr. Rattenbury's banking account. On the 18th of March, that banking account 
was very substantially overdrawn, and it had been overdrawn continuously in sums of fifty or sixty pounds for the preceding three months. On the 18th of March, a sum of two hundred and fifty pounds, which was in excess of anything which had been paid in for some time, was paid into the account from Mrs. Rattenbury's account. On the same day, Mrs. Rattenbury drew a cheque for fifty pounds, and Stoner cashed it. On the 9th of March, Mrs. Rattenbury and Stoner went to the Royal Palace Hotel at Kensington, London. Mrs. Rattenbury went shopping with Stoner and purchased a large number of apparels for Stoner, pyjamas and underclothing, suits of clothing, boots and various other things. These items were paid for through her account by Mrs. Rattenbury. During that time, Stoner had purchased for himself a diamond ring, for which he paid £15, which came out of the £50 cheque he had cashed. At some time or another, Mrs. Rattenbury appears to have given Stoner a gold watch. On Sunday, somewhere between 4pm, Irene Riggs went out for her usual time out. She left in the house Mr. and Mrs. Rattenbury and Stoner. She returned about 10.15 at night. Somewhere between these times, the crime was committed. She found Mrs. Rattenbury in the drawing room, dressed in her pyjamas. Mr. Rattenbury was sitting in an open armchair, and she noticed that he had what appeared to be a black eye. On the instructions of Mrs. Rattenbury, she telephoned Dr. Donnell, who arrived soon afterwards. He found Irene Riggs cleaning up the blood which had apparently dripped down from the head of Mr. Rattenbury onto the carpet. Dr. Donnell found on the left-hand side of Mr. Rattenbury's head, above the left ear, a longish wound, about an inch and a half long. It was apparent that blows from some heavy instrument had been used. The mallet. Between eight and half past eight that evening, Stoner called at the house of his grandmother. Mr. Stevens, the grandfather, is a carpenter, and a mallet was lent. The mallet was next found by the police officer early next morning in the garden at Five Manor Road. There were found adhering to it human hairs. There can be no doubt that the hairs were from the head of Mr. Rattenbury. The explanation. While waiting, Mrs. Rattenbury made a number of statements. She told Dr. Donald that she and Mr. Rattenbury had spent a happy evening together planning a visit to Bridgeport. She stated that he, the deceased, had given her a passage in a book to read about suicide. She said she went to bed early and was awakened by a noise and that she ran downstairs and saw her husband in the chair under the influence of drink. At 2 a.m. P.C. Bagwell arrived and saw Mrs. Rattenbury. At this stage there is no doubt that she was under the influence of drink. She said, I was playing cards with my husband until nine o'clock. I then went to my bedroom and at about 10.30 I heard a yell and came downstairs into the drawing room. I saw my husband sitting in the armchair and sent for Dr. Donnell. While a search was made, P.C. Bagwell remained behind, and while he was there, Mrs. Rattenbury made another statement. She said, I know who did it. The officer cautioned her. Mrs. Rattenbury said, I did it with a mallet. It is hidden. Rats, referring to Mr. Rattenbury, has lived too long. She then corrected herself and said, No, my lover did it. I will give you ten pounds. No, I won't bribe you. 
Having been cautioned again, she said, I did it. He gave me the book. He has lived too long. I will tell you in the morning where the mallet is. Then she added, I shall make a better job of it next time. I made a proper muddle of it. I thought I was strong enough. How did she know? Up to this time no weapon had been found. Stoner had been away. If the blows had been delivered whilst she was upstairs in her own room, how would she know that a mallet had been used and that it was hidden? Stoner's Alleged Statement Stoner said that he went to his bedroom at 8.50 on the Sunday night, that he had left Mr. and Mrs. Rattenbury and the boy John in the drawing room, and he was aroused at around 10.30 p.m. by Mrs. Rattenbury shouting to him to come down. He stated he came down and found Mr. Rattenbury in an armchair with blood running from his head. In Mrs. Rattenbury's next statement to the police, which was written down and signed, her statement read, At about 9pm on Sunday the 24th of March 1935, I was playing cards with my husband, and when he dared me to kill him as he wanted to die, I picked up a mallet. He then said, You have got guts enough to do it. I then hit him with the mallet. I hid the mallet outside the house. I would have shot him if I had had a gun. George Stoner Mr. Rattenbury did not die at once. Stoner went on living practically in the house for two or three days after Mrs. Rattenbury had been removed to Holloway Jail. On the 27th of March, he told Irene Riggs that he was going to see Mrs. Rattenbury the next day, and he said that he had put Mrs. Rattenbury in jail and he was going to see her and give himself up. Stoner went to the detention room at Bournemouth Police Station on the 29th of March and said to a police officer, Do you know that Mrs. Rattenbury had nothing to do with this affair? Stoner was cautioned, but he went on. When I did the job, I believed he was asleep. I hit him and then went upstairs and told Mrs. Rattenbury she rushed down then. With the many versions of confessions that the jury had to decide on, more background information came out. From the Daily Mirror, 29th of May, 1935. There were two sensations in yesterday's Old Bailey hearing of the Villa murder trial in which Mrs. Alma Victoria Rattenbury, Lausanne, the songwriter, and George Percy Stoner, her 18-year-old chauffeur, are accused of murdering Mrs. Rattenbury's 67-year-old husband. The first was the evidence of Dr. Donnell, Mrs. Rattenbury's doctor. Later, Mr. Justice Humphreys ordered to be passed to the jury a notebook which contained the signed statement said to have been made by Mrs. Rattenbury at 8.15am and also a number of cheques. A great deal has been made about the statement which Mrs. Rattenbury made, he said. Sometimes you can get some assistance from a person's signature as to whether they are capable of knowing what they are doing and what they are writing and whether they are in a fit state to write or not. Dr. Donnell was called to the Villa Madeira after Mr. Rattenbury had been injured. He said that the boy Stoner had confessed to him that he had been taking cocaine because it gave him a pleasant sensation. Mrs. Rattenbury, he added, had told him that Stoner had tried to strangle her. She admitted to him that Stoner was her lover. Dr. Donnell said that, in his opinion, Alma Rattenbury was not in a fit condition that night or next morning to make statements to the police. He would not place any reliance on what she said. Police Constable Bagwell said that while he was investigating in the Villa Madeira, Mrs. Rattenbury had tried to kiss him. 
from the Yorkshire and Leeds Intelligentsia, the 30th of May, 1935, in the witness box. In the witness box, which she occupied for three hours, Mrs. Rattenbury said she had been Stoner's mistress since November and that he had displayed great jealousy. On the night of March the 24th, he, Stoner, told her in her bedroom that he had hit Mr. Rattenbury over the head with a mallet. She rushed downstairs and remembered nothing of the events and the statements she made following her discovery of Mr. Rattenbury fatally injured. She declared that she did not murder her husband and that she did not take any part in planning it and that she knew nothing about it until Stoner spoke to her in her bedroom. On the 31st of May 1935, George was found guilty of Francis's murder. Alma was acquitted of all charges. The charge of guilty of murder carried the death sentence. From the Scotsman, the 1st of June, 1935. Stoner sentenced. End of Villa murder trial at the Old Bailey. The woman acquitted. Mrs. Alma Victoria Rattenbury was acquitted at the Old Bailey yesterday of the murder of her husband. George Percy Stoner, 18, who she said had been her lover, was found guilty and sentenced to death. The jury, who were absent for 48 minutes, recommended Stoner to mercy. In the cells at the court, a few minutes after the verdict had been given, Stoner spoke these words to his father. I am content. They have set her free. Whatever happens to me does not matter. The trial had lasted five days and had come to be known as the Villa Murder Trial. Mrs. Rattenbury was the first to hear her fate. She showed no emotion when the words not guilty were spoken by the foreman, but when a moment later she heard the jury pronounce Stoner guilty, she seemed to stagger and had to be supported in the dock. The foreman added the jury's recommendation to mercy. Sympathy for George within the papers and the public was reiterated with George being perceived as having found himself to be but a pawn that was being directed by older manipulative Alma. A few days after the trial, Alma boarded a train from Waterloo to Christchurch. She walked to the Arches Railway Bridge, walked into the water. She took a knife she had brought with her and plunged the knife into her heart. She died almost immediately. In some notes that she had left at the scene, Alma claimed that she had loved George, who she believed was to be hung shortly. She stated she was killing herself from the shame. From the Yorkshire Post and Leeds Intelligentsia, the 7th of June, 1935. Mrs. Rattenbury. Inquest was held this afternoon. The inquest on Mrs. Alma Victoria Rattenbury, who was found dead in a tributary of the River Stour at Christchurch near Bournemouth on Tuesday night, will be held at the Public Assistance Institution at Christchurch this afternoon. It is understood that about six witnesses will be called and that notes which were found in Mrs. Rattenbury's handbag will be read. Despite intensive search, the Christchurch police have failed so far to find the knife or dagger which was seen in Mrs. Rattenbury's hand just before her death. The Petition for Stoner The office in Bournemouth of Mr. F. W. Thistleton, the organiser of the petition for the reprieve of George Stoner, who is under sentence of death for the murder of Mr. M. Rattenbury, was the scene yesterday of a constant stream of people all anxious to help in some way or other. With the public and media outcry regarding what was believed to be a murder by George through Alma's machinations, 320,000 signatures 
were collected, requesting mercy for young George, who had been led astray. The Home Secretary listened, and George's execution was commuted to a prison sentence. George was released seven years later in 1942. He joined the army, which he served throughout World War II, and at the end of the war he returned to his home in Red Hill, Bournemouth, where he lived out his days to the age of 83. That concludes this episode of Murderous Mondays, a strange case of the East Cliff Mallet murder. We really hope you enjoyed the show. If you did enjoy the show, please subscribe. Our goal is 1,000 subscribers. And with the fantastic support of our wonderful News of the Times community, we are making great progress towards that goal. We upload six days a week. Fridays are a new limited series called Forgotten Fridays, where we explore a snapshot from newspaper articles, advertisements and publications of a time from long ago. Saturdays are Serial Killer Saturdays, where we do an in-depth look at a serial killer from our extensive database. The time span of these ranges from as early as the mid-16th century to the 21st century and encompasses men, women, children and couples who kill. Sundays are eccentrics as we do an in-depth look at some of the quirky, unusual, notable and bizarre characters from Great Britain, which offers up a rich supply to choose from. Mondays are murderous, where we investigate in depth a historical murder. Tuesdays are twisted and usually involve a collection of stories based around a theme, such as stories of matricide or when employers go bad. Wednesdays are wicked in this new series that will explore outrageous organisations, bloody locations and shocking events with a bit of murder and mayhem sprinkled in. From all of us at News of the Times, thank you again for watching or listening. This has been News at the Times, and I am Robin Coles.